Welcome to Digital Asset News. Take your top stories in crypto and break them down into bite-sized pieces. Today, I want to do a follow-up to uh, one of the more popular videos that we have done, and it all talked about moving to Puerto Rico and what I've learned. So I'm going to tell you about some things that uh, I personally screwed up on, things that uh, I would do uh, completely different, and the things that I would keep the same. So to do that, let's just jump into uh, the piece I think is most important. So this is the old video that we did. I will link that in the description. You can check it out. This is just me moving down here. Uh, the first, the one below where it says pay no taxes, that's was me getting ready. Then Puerto Rico part one, this is me when I was here for uh, a little bit of time and to see just how things were going. And now I wanna move into a little bit more into what I've found out. So first of all, let's just do a quick review. Uh, there is a lot of confusion about Act 20 and 21 and Act 60. Act 20 and 21 was the very first part, and that it was written in 2012. And there was two parts to that. The Export Services Tax Incentive, which is if you're a corporation, you could uh, move over here, only pay 4%, but you'd have to export those services of whatever your corporation did. Like you couldn't move here and import uh, some basket weaving uh, franchise and just only sell baskets to Puerto Ricans. You'd have to export that uh, to wherever other countries that you could. The next part was the investor resident individual tax incentives. And what those are, what that was for was for people who were like cryptocurrency investors or Wall Street guys and gals who wanted to not pay capital gains tax. So those Act 2021 was actually rolled into Act 60 in 2019. And just like I talked about, here was the incentives. First of all, no capital gains, dividends or royalties. There was no property tax exemption. This is for the corporation part. Uh, greater than 3 million, you have to pay 75% of property taxes. But if it's less than 3 million, uh, you were 100% tax exempt. And also uh, you were at two to 4%, depending on some criteria for your corporate tax versus the United States, which is uh, 21 to 30% corporate tax right now. So that's pretty good. So what's the criteria? What would you have to do to hit that? Well, it came down to a couple different things. First of all, you couldn't be a Puerto Rico resident from 2005 on. So if you lived in Puerto Rico from then, 2005, 6, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12, 21, you were not eligible for Act 60 or 2021. It's just how it goes. Then there was three tests you had to prove. The presence, closer connection, and home. Presence means if you want to get this Act 60, you have to be here 183 days, hard stop. Uh, there is no nothing around that. Next part was closer connections. That means that you, if you lived here and like your family lived someplace else, another country, that didn't fly. If it, uh, family, significant other, kids, they all must live with you uh, in this area, in Puerto Rico, or else you wouldn't hit the criteria. And lastly, it says home. And what this means is you have to purchase some type of property within two years of moving to Puerto Rico. Like you can't just Airbnb forever. You gotta buy something here. And that's one of those things that uh, helps to assure that you are a real resident. Also, uh, there was an annual donation. And every year, if you want to uh, keep hitting that Act 60 for uh, no capital gains or, or, or no um, uh, interest for your corporations, you have to put in $10,000 annual donation to two nonprofits of your choice. So the ten, so the $10,000 must be to two nonprofits, which would equal up. And we're going to get into the details of that a little bit. Also, there's a $5,000 one-time reporting fee. Uh, in, for corporations, you have to incorporate in Puerto Rico, fill out the paperwork, pay some uh, some uh, some dollars for that. And then also, if you made more than $3 million in revenue, you got to get an employee. If you have less than $3 million, don't worry. You don't have to pay for any employees, but it's good to bring jobs here. And I'm gonna tell you just how important that actually is. So this was, for me, when I got into this, I was like, this is why I thought it was a pretty good idea to move to Puerto Rico. And it made sense at the time, and it really did. First of all, tax savings now. I thought, and the uh, individual that I talked to who will remain nameless, uh, that legal individual told me, and they wrote an opinion, that, hey, <clears throat> everything that you bring over uh, will be tax exempt. I don't care when you bought it, I'll write you an opinion and that was it. Well, I've talked to many a CPA and they're like, that's not gonna fly. You can try it, <clears throat> you can try it. But in all honesty, 
uh, the IRS is going to really crack down on this. So it's up to you if you want to give it a go. And I was like, no, I've already tussled with the IRS. And if it's going to be that flimsy, I don't want to deal with it. So when I moved here in April, that means everything uh, from April 2021 before I owe capital gains tax on and everything after April 2021, I don't own capital gains. So it all depends on when you move here. That's when your capital gains. But you cannot get around it by moving here and going, eh, I don't own anything. It doesn't work like that. Second thing was the weather. That was going to be pretty great. And in truth, it is. It really is. I thought there'd be new challenges uh, and uh, also connections in community because there is a, a heavy presence of crypto uh, OGs or people who have been around for quite some time here in Puerto Rico. So this is why I thought Puerto Rico was a pretty good idea. However, here's why it was actually a bad idea. And it comes down to this. So the first thing, like I said, tax savings. I didn't save too much on tax because the majority of what I bought, where most of my gains were, was from dollar cost averaging, which I think you know if you follow me on the channel. I've dollar cost averaged since 2017. Uh, I was buying Bitcoin when it was five, six, seven thousand, Cardano when it was seven, eight cents, Ethereum when it was two, three hundred, four hundred dollars. But I will own capital gains. So it's not going to make sense, not now. Also, it's expensive to live in Puerto Rico. I don't know how people here do it if you live here and work here and don't have a really fantastic job. It's super expensive. I'll give you some examples in a bit. As far as connections, I could have the same thing at home. I'll be honest with you. I have made so many more connections just through Twitter and my YouTube channel and different uh, channels. That's uh, it's 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 actually astounding. You don't have to really physically be anywhere to make connections. Uh, it helps, but you don't have to. Then also, there's this thing called Yankee Go Home hashtag Abolish Act 60, and this is important for a number of reasons about where I have seen Puerto Rico is and where it is potentially going. And let's just back up uh, before we go any farther because I need to uh, bring some information to light, which I think will uh, make a lot of sense uh, moving forward. So first of all, where the heck is Puerto Rico? And if you don't know, here's Puerto Rico. There's a nice big, big uh, red <laughs> uh, piece here. This is Puerto Rico down here. So here's Florida, Miami, here's the Bahamas, here's Turks and Caicos Islands, very nice place. Here's Cuba. Here's Haiti, Dominican Republic. This is Puerto Rico, right by the British Virgin Islands, St. Lucia, uh, Barbados, blah, 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 right? Here's Jamaica. And over here, here's Honduras and Guatemala, Belize. So this is Puerto Rico, not as close to the mainland U.S. as you one might think, but that is exactly where it is. And as far as Act 60, you can, I'm going to link this in the description. You can read the entire law. It's in Spanish. So, you know, have fun with that. If you don't speak Spanish, read a little difficult, I think. And then here's the actual law. Act 60, signed into effect 2019. You can also read this. I'll link in the description. Now, as far as corporate taxes and America, I don't know where you're at, but for the U.S., the U.S. imposes a tax on the profits of U.S. resident corporations at a rate of 21%. Now, just to be crystal clear, corporations don't pay 21%. There's this thing called deductions, so they don't pay as much, that's for sure. But it was reduced from 35% in 2017. And we get a bunch of taxes, uh, about 230 billion in America, which is 7% roughly of the total federal revenue down from 9% in 2017. So you can see why it's a little attractive to go from 21%, maybe down to 4%. But it's not only just on the federal taxes for corporations. Also remember that in, uh, you also have state corporate taxes. Look at uh, Iowa, 12%. Illinois, 9.5%. Alaska, 9.4%. California, almost 9%. So you take that uh, that's, uh, federal tax, tack on the state tax, and you got around 30, 35%. Who knows? Uh, it's, it's super high, minimizing deductions. So that's why that part is so appealing to some people. Also, what I talked about as far as uh, being expensive, here's an example. This is just Walmart, Walmart website. And if you're in El Paso, Texas, here are the prices today. You're welcome. Uh, the gallon of milk is around three bucks, just so you know. All right. Also, if you take a look at uh, what we have for this place called Supermax, and if you're in Puerto Rico, you know what Supermax is. It's it's a grocery store. It's a chain, and it's in every block, it seems like. <laughs> it's all over the place. So a gallon of milk is around six, seven bucks. All right. Here's some other stuff. Here's some Lunchables and some almond milk, three bucks, okay. 
And also, if you took a look at that and compare it to over here, a little bit of a price increase. Now, if you take a look at Walmart here in Puerto Rico, it's still five bucks for a gallon of milk. So just so you know, it's probably the cheapest to, to shop at Walmart, but that's just for these items, okay? If you take a look at like, I mean, gas is, is higher, uh, clothes are higher, uh, vehicles also have an import tax. Everything has a damn import tax. So just know you're going to pay a lot of money for everything. And then going to restaurants, whew, super pricey. So that's just so you know, uh, one of the things that I, I was now made fully aware of, it's expensive to live here. Also, the Abolish Act 60 part. This is going to follow you. If you're from America, this is going to follow you wherever you're at. Okay. And it's not as, it just depends. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because it's important that you understand why I'm going to recommend certain uh, charities as opposed to other charities here and where I think that there is a lot of good to be done uh, in Puerto Rico. So I'm going to go over this as quickly as I possibly can. So this is an article written about a year ago. Influencers, developers, cryptocurrency tycoons, how Puerto Ricans are fighting back against the outsiders using the island as a tax haven. First of all, you will see this beautiful house behind me, right? Beautiful. Uh, this was not sold to me by a German. This was sold to me by a Puerto Rican. And the Puerto Rican lives here in Puerto Rico. So when the houses are sold and people are using that money, I don't know what they do with it, okay? I'm just here for my part. You have a price, I pay that price. And that's pretty much it. We'll talk about gentrification and does it happen? Yes, it does. Does it push people out? Yes, it does. However, is that the primary reason for everything? I don't think it is. And I'm gonna talk to you about that right now. So let me scroll down here. There's just two parts. Abolish Act 60. This article states, the government says Puerto Rico needs the money. I cannot deny that. Whoever set up Act 60, not a good, not really that great. Uh, I would have been okay with paying a little bit of, of, of taxes on uh, capital gains. That's just me. You can talk, but talk to me in the, in the comments. But it states here, the island currently has an unemployment rate of 9% and has been in a recession since the tax incentives began. So I'm going to tell you that's not true. This Act 60, this is not when the problems began. It happened a long time ago. Here's an article from 2015. Tax policy helped create Puerto Rico's fiscal crisis. There was a program called Section 936. Puerto Rico, one of the central drivers of its economic growth, has been the U.S. tax code. True, for over 80 years. The federal government granted various tax incentives to U.S. corporations operating in Puerto Rico in order to spur the industrialization of the island. I don't think that's the best thing to do. I think they could have done it with a little bit more taxes, but whatever. I'm not here to debate that. So in 1976, Section 936 of the tax code granted U.S. corporations a tax exemption from income originating from U.S. territories. Exemption. I can see a reduction. But an exemption? It seems kind of crazy, but uh, I'm not an economist. Because of these generous tax incentives for businesses, Puerto Rico grew rapidly, that's good, throughout the 20th century and developed a substantial manufacturing sector, though it remained relatively poor compared to the U.S. Uh, however, because Sanction 936 made a foreign investment in Puerto Rico artificially, that's a key word, attractive, creating an effect in economic bubble, it left the island vulnerable to a crash if the tax provisions were ever to be repealed. And guess what happened? In 96, President Clinton signed legislation that phased out Section 936 over a 10-year period, leaving it to be fully repealed at the beginning of 2006. So when we talk about Act 60 as the beginning of the end, it's not how it was. It happened a lot longer. And, this, and 936 happened in the 70s, and before that, it was something else. So to me, this is how I see the GDP growth from 2000 on, you can see it was stopped in 96. It had a little bit of a spike, but as far as when it was totally phased out in 2006, you can see the GDP dropped off the face of the planet. 2006 also marked the beginning of a deep recession for Puerto Rico, which has lasted until today. And just so you know, as far as the pharmaceuticals companies, they're the ones that took advantage of it. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's what, those were the laws that they had. So here, just so you know, pharmaceutical companies generated more than 18,000 jobs in Puerto Rico. 
It pays more than $3 billion in taxes, and it generated more than a quarter, 25% of the island's GDP for the past four decades. So you can see why that was actually important for them to come here. But no, no tax, kind of crazy. But again, not an economist. Pharmaceutical companies came in the 1960s and 70s. And then as of 2014, Puerto Rico produces 16 of the top 20 selling drugs in the mainland U.S. And just so you know, uh, the pharmaceutical companies are still here, but they're also being phased out. So like we can find tax advantages someplace else, and that's where they're going. So then to finish this up, this is why it's so important we understand this part. Here's the poverty rate in Puerto Rico. I can only go back to 2005. Actually, I looked before that there was some data it was around 40%. Poverty rate in 2005 was still 45%. And you see in 2006, when everything stopped, it, was, it went up, then it went down. And then, of course, in 2012, when you had Acts uh, 21 and 22, it actually wasn't too bad, 44, but it's still the same as in 2005. It dropped off in 2014 and 15, now to 43. And now we're actually at a lower point than what we were before. So not too bad so far. However, if you look at poverty line at 44%, then that's awesome. That sucks. Here are the 10 states with the highest poverty rates in the U.S. Mississippi leads the pack at 20%. Puerto Rico is double that, but I think there's a potential reason for that. And I will say this, you can only learn things from being here. And I've got friends who are in construction that have lived in Puerto Rico almost their entire lives, pretty much their entire lives. And they tell me this, they go, Rob, the poverty rates are a little bit different because here's the thing for construction wise, uh, people do not want to get paid on the payroll. Why not? Well, it's because they can gain a ton of, of money through government programs, but they have to stay unemployed. So we pay people in cash. Does it happen everywhere? No. Does it happen somewhere? Sure. Are those numbers as far as poverty correct? I don't think so. But is there a poverty problem? Absolutely. So there is a gray economy. And again, you can only know that unless you've actually been here and talked to some people. And that's what I have known. I will say this though. This leads me to my last point. The household income in Puerto Rico is 20,000 bucks, $20,000. Is that because of poor education? No, bachelor's degrees, 27, about a, about a quarter of people. Employment rate, 38.7. But I want you to hone in on this number right here. The total employer establishments, 44,748. Let's compare this to the great state of where I'm from, Texas. Household income is 64,000. Are they smarter? Debatable. <laughs> I'm from Texas. I'm not that smart. Bachelor's degree, 30%. It's pretty much in line with what we had over here, 27%. Employment rate, 61%. Employment rate, 38%. And this number, again, this is in Puerto Rico. Total employer establishments, 44,000. How many do you have in Texas? 609,476. So when you take a look at what's going on, there's no jobs. Or there's no jobs that pay pretty well or enough to get things going. And this was a study in 2017. Why do Puerto, Puerto Ricans move to the mainland? It's job related. It's the jobs. That's really what it comes down to. So I know there's a long explanation, but it's going to kind of shape the things we're going to talk about in a little bit as to where things are going and where I see or where I'm going to be putting my efforts and money into as far as nonprofits. So let's stop that one and let's jump back real quick to what we were just talking about as far as why it was a bad idea. So we've got this up. Now we know of why. Let's talk about the hows. There are positives of the move that I can tell you right now. And one of those, of course, is if you want to move here in Puerto Rico, look, I don't know where things are going as far as the crypto market. It is March 7th, 2022. Ukraine has been invaded by Russia. The world is on fire. The market cap has gone, I mean, from 3.1 trillion all the way down to 1.8 trillion in not too much time. So I can't tell you what's gonna happen, but I can tell you that in the future, this is the time to plan. And this will be the time to take a look at options. And I'm not telling you what to do, not investment advice, just investment opinion. So one thing that is, I would say, is in the future, it's gonna work out pretty well. Uh, the positives of, for us is the rentals or the property that we did buy, we learned a lot from being here. We learned what the people are going to need. We learned that there are management companies 
people who live in Puerto Rico, who we hire to manage our properties, because I think that's the best idea for us. And it actually helps out the economy. Also, there's connections that have been made. I've made some, met some pretty great people. And you can only do that when you get to the actual island itself. Also, you get out of your comfort zone. I've never done a meetup. Now I do one every two weeks. And I, I love them. They're great. It's where they get uh, some of the best insight into what's going on with uh, just people itself. And then two things before we, well, one thing, I guess, before we get into the, uh, uh, the donations. Uh, as you know, when I moved here, we came out with our dogs. Uh, one of our dogs got lymphoma. And if I had to deal, if, if Chewy had to go through uh, the chemo part for the vet in, in Texas, it would have been a real hassle. But there is a great vet. Uh, it's over at uh, Condado. And this is just a selfish one. Is, uh, it's, his name is Gabriel. I want to give him a shout out because they are fantastic in taking care of those things. So uh, that is that part. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have met those great people over there at the Condado uh, Veterinary Clinic. But here's what I want to talk about as far as as I call it, FF versus F, financial freedom versus fulfillment, and the ten thousand uh, dollar donation. So when I talk about these things, I don't take it lightly. I think it's important that you understand where, you know, where to put your money uh, in general. So real quick about that, about that great vet vet hospital. This is their website, and the reason I do this is because uh, uh, Gabriel, he's. Uh, he owns the, the the vet clinic, and he's looking for another vet to to uh, to come in with him. You don't even have, you don't even have to know Spanish. It's in like the most uh, touristy place by Condado, and they are fantastic. So if you're gonna move here and you're a veterinarian, just so you know, that place is is one of the tops as far as its uh, accreditation. It's got 12 to 15 uh, percent AAHA standard. Uh, which means it's like one of the top 12 to 15 percent of all the vet practices in the U.S. and Canada. So you're getting a great place. It's awesome. I can connect you again. Uh, Gabriel's email, the vet, will be in the description, so you can uh, talk to them. Again, don't even know Spanish. Not a big deal. This leads me to my next point as far as donations. Ten thousand dollar donations. What are you going to do? Where are you going to put it? Well, I think there's some places that need a little more help than others. That's all I'll say. Just so you know. The first $5,000 must go out of your 10,000 to a nonprofit organization listed by Comisión Especial Conjunta de Fondos Legislativos para Impacto Comunitario. Nailed it, which publishes an annual list with approved organizations, CECFL. Jeez, that's a, it's like I'm back in the army with that mnemonic. And then next, the next $5,000 can go to any Puerto Rican uh, 501c3 or here rate, they call it 1101.01 nonprofit of your choice. Uh, but one point to bear in mind is that the organization, the second one, cannot be on the CE CFL's list. So you got to put 5,000 into one on the list and 5,000 that's not on the list. That's just 1101. What the heck is CE CFL? Well, I'm going to link that in the description so you can find it yourself. And this is essentially exactly what it is. When you click on the list itself, uh, it's first of all, it's super small, which kind of sucks. But if you zoom in, it's in Spanish, but you can figure it out. But what's great about this is like you can go to, you can contact the people. Most everybody here speaks English, honestly. Uh, but or you can just go to their website. So see how it says like uh, Katiana at uh, Alianza PRs in Drogos.com. Just go to that website or adopt and npr.org and you can see what exactly it is and you can uh, make your just make your donation there as you see fit but there's one thing like there was one that was called boxing bullies and i clicked on that i was like this looks good and this is the jake paul one look at that jake paul has moved here and he's got his own uh, uh non-profit but just so you know which is great i i can't take anything away from that. that's pretty great i mean bullying is an awful awful epidemic uh, these days with kids, which is awful. But just so you know, uh, they've raised uh, $416,270. $416,270. That's a good amount of money, right? That's great. Good for them. I think, and you can go into that, but like we just talked about, I think there's some issues that we need to address, which is People need jobs, and that's what it comes down to. 
So I'm going to give to two organizations, and one of those is Protechos. So Protechos, this place, it actually, I'll, let me show you here. This is a place that trains people how to be roofers, how to install roofs, and, and they do it for free uh, in the community. So they work closely with the community. They network with the local community leaders and religious institutions to locate the most urgent cases, like elderly people who don't have a roof. And they train these individuals, these people who want to learn. They pay them to actually install the roofs, and then they can go and work in any construction site they want to. They prioritize homes with children, elderly, or sick occupants. And how it works is, I thought it was pretty cool. And I actually met, this is uh, Emily. I met her at one of the meetups, matter of fact. And she said that she had a nonprofit. I'm like, great. And this is how they do it. If you're a trainee, you get $7.25 an hour just to train. And they teach you how to be a roofer, which I think is pretty great. And if you want to stick on, you know, they can, if you want to be a trainer, 12 to 14 bucks. But trust me, if you're in construction, you're making great money, especially here in Puerto Rico. It is pricey to get good people. So uh, I think this could be one of those uh, great ones. The program draws some residents who are willing able to work, provide them with carpentry training through hands-on education, paid minimum wage, everything else. And what's great about this, when you donate, uh, you can use PayPal, Ateache, which is uh, here, uh, the local uh, app, or you can use cryptocurrency. And also if you click on about us and click on contact, if you don't wanna like, well, I don't know how that's gonna work because I have to show that I actually paid the $5,000, you, they actually take checks, which is crazy to me, but they do take checks and you can prove it and all those things. So it's kind of hard to, to donate with blockchain and then prove it on the blockchain and so on and so forth. But Emily, uh, she sends letters out to everybody. If you have any questions, uh, this Protechos will be a link in the description. I think it's uh, a pretty a pretty great thing. And then also uh, when we take a look at like jobs themselves, I think that we can all agree that uh, developers are in high demand. So this was another gentleman I met at one of the meetups. His name's Adam. And this is a franchise called Whole Burton School. And what they do is they train people to become full stack developers. And they do that in 10 months. And it's a pretty intensive uh, format, but here's how it works. So when you go through this process, and I'm gonna link this here, there, it's specific to San Juan, Puerto Rico. When you go through the process of learning how to uh, learn how to be a full stack developer, you don't pay a dime in tuition. They actually put that off until afterwards. So once you're done with the training, then you pay back only if you get a job and become a developer. I personally don't see how you wouldn't get a job as a developer. That seems to be a pretty big thing. And they teach all types of things as far as like computer learning, blockchain, all this great stuff. There's a link and, uh, you can uh, sign up and see how it goes. There's some things to note here about the school. First of all, it's $50,000 that you're going to pay back. However, full stack developers make some pretty good money. I'll just start with that. Second of all, it's very intensive. So when you go through this, the nonprofit part is as such. When you go through it and you're like, hey, I got kids to feed. I got a family to take care of and you can't make it. The nonprofit part, it pays you between $500 and $1,000 just to be a student there. And that comes from us. That comes from the people that donate there. So you can go to school, tuition-free, pay back later. So it's not tuition-free, I suppose. But you also get paid $500 to $1,000, whatever you need apparent, uh, for your types of expenses to take care of your family. And hopefully after 10 months, you can make it and go through there. And then you don't have to pay that part back. So that is the nonprofit aspect of becoming a developer. And there's one more caveat, and that is that uh, for this process, when you sign up here, you're gonna take a test. And that test is pretty hard. And from what Adam tells me, usually uh, one out of 10 people can get to the test. So if you think that, uh, if you're watching this and you're in Puerto Rico, you're like, hey, I'd like to be a developer. Go through this, see how it works, and uh, hopefully you can get through the application process and become a full stack developer. And that is where I think uh, things could potentially go. I'll be adding more things on there as far as like for jobs, but in my personal opinion, I think Puerto Rico is a great place. I just don't think it has a lot of good jobs, a lot of great jobs, a lot of enough, enough jobs uh, for what the people actually need here. I could be wrong, but that's how I see things. All right, so that takes care of that little piece. And let's finish this up with talking about 
the last sections as far as like <laughs> ah, living. So, so for right here, would I do it again? That's the real question. Would I do it again? Yeah, I would do it again. And uh, I would just change a couple of things. First of all, who I signed up with, I can't recommend that group again. And I'm going to tell you who I would have you sign up with as far as if you want a more hands-on or a hands-off approach. Second of all, I would set up a CPA from the very start because you want to know exactly what you're getting into and you want to get all your bookkeeping in, in order, especially if you're a corporation. And then also I would have, uh, well, CryptoTrader.tax is what I use for my taxes. I would still use that because I could just put that in and get my CPA, but I'd find a CPA first. Also, uh, I would be studying Spanish rapidly because if you want to fit in, um, everybody, a lot of people speak English. That's true. But if you really want to fit in into a, into a Puerto Rico and culture, you want to speak the language of the island. It's just, I can't explain it, but if you really want to be a part of the things, that's the culture. So Spanish, and I'll tell you how I'm doing it. I would have waited until there was a down market for the housing because it's awfully expensive here. And then also, I would do it again because there are talks that Act 60 might be going away, but it's been talking about that for a while. But you never know because there is uh, some unrest in the legislature. Also, uh, I, as far as like property challenges, as far as buying stuff, appliances and things like that, I'm going to show you where I would buy things once you get your house. And then also to meet people, there's a, uh, a secret list I have for you and I'm going to tell you how to get it in all those things. So real quick, let me go over this uh, in a nutshell. I think this is also uh, as important as I can make it. So if we take a look at, um, first of all, who I recommend, it depends. Do you want to have a hands-on or a hands-off approach? If you want to have like more of a, a hands, hands-off uh, approach, there's this website called PR Relocate or Relocate Puerto Rico. Dot com And it talks about, this is X60, and the, the two we talk about, export services, investor resident. Here's how much it costs. Uh, first of all, if you're a corporation, it's free. They do it for free. And they say, we're a qualified promoter with the Puerto Rico Department of Commerce. We are compensated by the government, not you. You will still need to pay the standard application fees, which isn't much, like 700 bucks. They give you a business plan, a business structure, LLC creation, application. And first of all, I have no affiliate with these people. I have no affiliation. They're not paying me a damn dime. Uh, I just found them. I went on the phone with them and just talked to them like, do you guys still do this? And like, yeah, of course we do. Why, what do you, have you ever heard of us? And uh, no, I have not because I use somebody else. So, and then also if you're an investor resident, uh, the application is two grand. I'm just going to tell you that I paid uh, a high five figures. Yeah, for mine. And uh, that's all I will say about that. But I would not do that again. So again, they give you introduction call, case evaluation, application submission, tracking, compliance support, relocation compliance, initial setup of water, electric, internet, and cable utilities, which you're going to need to get a bank account here. And we'll talk about that in a second. And then also, if you're, you don't have a place right now, they'll set you up with a virtual mailbox, which would meet that criteria, uh, right, of uh, presence or home. So they can set you up with a virtual mailbox, 49 bucks per month. Now, yeah, some within two years, you're still going to have to buy property. Don't get me, don't get it twisted, but that's a pretty good thing. And also, there was some pieces here I want to bring, bring to your attention. So here's what we got. Uh, when can I apply for the Export Services Tax Incentive? You can apply for the Export Services Act anytime. What is the process? Uh, and this is where it gets, this is why I say, if you want a hands-on or hands-off, you can, the individual needs to submit an application to the Office of Industrial Tax Exemption, which is the Division of the Department of Economic Development and Commerce of Puerto Rico. Have fun going down there and filling out that paperwork and finding the place and getting it right and everything else. You can do it. But again, why don't you just go to some place like you know this or the uh, the lawyer who I'm going to recommend pretty soon for a hands off approach? How much does it cost? Seven fifty, application fee. So that's pretty good. What's the start date for my services decree? The export services decree is retroactive to the date of filing. So even if you don't get approved uh, for six to eight months, it'll go retroactive to the date of filing. Uh, do I need to move to Puerto Rico for the export services? Again, this is for the corporation four percent tax. No. The export services tax incentive is based on the business and not the individual. However, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 
regarding retained earnings and controlled foreign corporations may disincentivize shareholders from living in the U.S. due to the mandatory re repetition of retained earnings or a global intangible low income. We recommend that any export service business relocate to Puerto Rico. I do it myself. Makes sense. Do I need to set up a bank account in the Puerto Rico for the expert services? No, but it's recommended. And I'm going to tell you right now, just do it. And we're going to talk about those in a second. Now for the investor resident act, which is, you know, if you have cryptocurrency capital gains or a wall street person, this is the other one. Uh, and of course in act 60, you can, whichever ones you want to do, they're all, they're both in there. So when can I apply? You can apply for the investor resident individual tax at any time before or after you move to Puerto Rico. However, you must be a resident of Puerto Rico for your investor resident individual degree to be effective. Remember 183 days. How much does it cost? Same thing we talked about. 750 application fee, $100 acceptance stamps, 5,000 one-time acceptance fee. That's just one time, but $10,000 annual donation to nonprofits like we talked about. What's the process? The individual needs to submit an application, blah, 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 blah. Again, I would recommend you go through a program. How long does it take for an investor individual application to be approved? It takes about 60 days. Now this one takes 60 days, but the other one, the one we just talked about, the uh, Export Services Act, I don't know if I highlighted it, but it takes six to eight months. It's in the FAQ. I will link this in the description so you can read all these FAQs if you want to. And then this one was interesting, these last two. How do I split a capital gain between appreciation before moving to Puerto Rico and after moving? This was my issue. There are two types of investments. Marketable investments has a public market price. Note the investment price on the day you move to Puerto Rico. This is the date that bifurcates your gain. So for me, April. Non-marketable investments. Using the days of ownership method, you would allocate your gains by dividing how many days in each jurisdiction you own the asset. If you want to do that, go right ahead. Talk to the CPA. And then lastly, like I said, this was interesting. Does my spouse also need an investor resident individual decree? Yes. Why? Factors like community property and life events like divorce or death may complicate your scenario, especially here if one hasn't and one doesn't. So if uh, you're like, well, I don't know about that. So maybe just throw on the uh, husband or wife or significant other just to be sure. And then also, so just so you know, this isn't some fly by night place. Uh, as I see it, like they've, done, they've been quite a bit. Uh, even like up to a month ago, Google client reviews looks to be pretty good. And uh, here's the people. Michael founded EBFAB, one of the leading investment visa companies. Sam here, managing partner at Affiliate Network. Travis, general manager at Uber. And now he's on this one, Pilar Rivera. She was a, or is a licensed New York attorney. She's the one that uh, actually is on the calls. Volunteer with Safe Passage, an organization that links unaccompanied minors to pro bono legal representation. It's pretty good. And then Chris here, also an attorney, and you got brokers and everything else. So pretty good uh, company. And then lastly, I thought this was the coolest thing. I will also link this. Once you, if you want to schedule a free call, they got all this stuff you can do. They got this thing called resources. And I wish I had this, but I didn't. So you got tax incentives, all the things you need. Here's the schools. If you're moving down here with the kids, you can take a look at all the schools. The real estate, we'll get into this. Air, Airbnb works, Zillow, no. Puerto Rico MLS, no. This one called Classificado is the one I want to look at. Banks, there's really three banks. Scotia Bank, I've only seen like, I don't think I've ever seen one, but it's also, it's all Banco Popular, First Bank and Oriental. And these are the things you're going to need to set up with. And this is why you're going to need um, the utility bills, which they can set you up with and everything you're gonna need to actually get everything moving. Here's your utilities, here's the gyms, and here's something that's pretty cool, learning Spanish. Uh, that's pretty important. So those are the two things, Like that's like a, a hands-on, you gotta do a little bit of thing. Here's a hands-off approach. This is what I would have done if I would have met Jaime back in the day. This is Jaime Aponte, Parsi, and he is the lawyer that we use for our property deals. Great guy. He's been here for decades. I mean, he's lived here his whole life, but he's been practicing for decades. Uh, in his uh, firm, established trains over six decades of a combined experience, tax exemption, estate settlements, condo sales, dispute resolutions, real estate. And real quick, just so you know, if you call him, I'm going to link him in the description. Here's uh, Jaime and what you can expect. Yeah. All right, everybody. So as promised, uh, what I got is uh, Jaime Aponte Parsi here. He's been a lawyer here for Puerto Rico for uh, 30 plus years. And uh, he's got the inside track on Act 60. So Jaime, I've got four questions for you. First of all, can you help people out with the Act 60? Yes or no? Yes, absolutely. 
Fantastic. And then also, can Puerto Ricans apply for Act 60? Not unless they haven't been residents here for the last 10 years or so. Great. And we'll get into that. Now, also, is there rumblings going on in the legislature about revoking Act 60? They're not revoking Act 60, but they're going to tinker with it because the governor has appointed a commission to look at tax reform in a very broad sense. Great. So that makes sense. We should, if you're going to get an Act 60, do it sooner than later because you can get grandfathered in. Makes sense. And the last question is, Jaime, do you have any CPAs that uh, can help us out with the tax stuff? Yes, we're working with two accounting firms right now. Um, they are getting into the very busy part of the year. So we're trying to recommend clients now before you know, we're already in February. But Fantastic. yes, the answer is yes. There are people who can help you and should help you with compliance. Great. So everybody that, that's watching this right now, we did a deeper dive into this, which I'm going to put onto the website and also on YouTube. You can check that out later. Jaime, thanks for coming in. We appreciate it. Okay. So that's Jaime in a nutshell. And then also that one part about learning Spanish, you can use Duolingo and all those things, but look, I've done that. I go off and on. And I just got to tell you, you're going to need something that really puts you in there. And it's all about immersion. So I've had friends who have gone through uh, the language program in the U.S. Army. Also had friends go through it for um, to be um, the people that go through the different countries uh, for the Church of Latter-day Saints and and uh, talk to different people in Korea and uh, Africa and things like that. And what they always tell me is the same thing. Uh, missionaries, that's what they are. What they always tell me is the same thing. You have to go through an immersion process to pick it up the fastest way. Like my friend Brian, he learned Farsi in three months. And the way they do it is because they sit you down and they only speak Farsi to you for three months straight. You probably don't have the time for that. However, uh, what would be great instead of having a whole classroom is just have Spanish lessons. And uh, this is Preply. And I have a refer a friend link and I'm only giving this to you because I use them personally. I've done this now for five hours or so. And all they do is speak Spanish to you and they speak and they teach you the things to say and, and how bad you are, actually. So you don't have to use my refer a friend thing. I just get more hours to be added in uh, so I can take more, more lessons. You can go right to preply, P-R-E-P-L-Y dot com, or you can lose, use the link in the description. But this is what I use. You set it all up and they've got and it's like 15 bucks an hour for a private tutor. And it's kind of like it's, it's, it's a Zoom interaction. And it's right there. Like, I think this is probably one of the better ways to do things and, and uh, just to get your own private tutor. 12 bucks an hour, 18 bucks, not bad, 14. And there's like thousands of them. I mean, 4,000 Spanish teachers available. So I think it's a good way to actually, you know, job creation and things like that. Also, on top of that, I recommend my man Big E Crypto because it's good to do the lessons, but they're not going to have you for eight hours a day. It's going to be like one lesson, maybe every couple of days. In between the time, you're going to want to do more Spanish stuff. So why don't you, if you're in crypto, that's why my man Big E is into crypto. He just started and he's got a great channel and it's all in Spanish. So why don't you try to do that and pick up some Spanish and listen to crypto on the same time? So there's that. And then also, as far as like I talked about, as far as like moving down here for and getting your property, import taxes are, are big. Also, you're going to, have to wait a lot for your um, appliances. There's a place called Nuevos Con Damage, and I will link in the description, the phone number and the address. They have like thousand dollar, multi thousand dollar refrigerators and stoves and stuff like that, microwaves. They're like, they're like major, like 50% off because they got a ding here and there. So uh, go to those guys because they have a ton of stuff in stock as opposed to going to places like Home Depot and Lowe's. You're not going to find stuff there. Maybe Sears, but that's about it. And then also, if you're going to try to actually uh, furnish your new house or new condo that you're going to buy, you're going to want to go to Ikea. There's a bunch of them, like three or four here. And the only one that actually has the stuff that you can buy and pick up instead of having it shipped here in over two or three months is called Ikea Main Puerto Rico on the Santa Rosa Mall. I will link that in the description as well so you can find all the stuff you want to uh, furnish your place with. And then also, here is, lastly, that secret group I was telling you about. Like, it's cool uh, when you, you know, you have all these things going through and uh, you're trying to find like, you know, friends and stuff like that. Like I'll see you in meetups, but wouldn't it be awesome if you could have uh, a WhatsApp group for all the different interests that you're into, right? So like this one's got, if you're singles, sure. Uh, you've got uh, 
uh, acro yoga, which is like balance yoga for partners and some of that basketball, fire spinners, beach, tennis, beer pong. I like that biohacking. I want to get in that one. Uh, and then some other stuff here, which I need to now black out because I don't want you to see their numbers, but here's the thing about this. This document was given to me by somebody, but he, the thing is that I can't give it to you. This work has become a victim of a success. Groups listed have bumped up against WhatsApp's 256 member group size limit. Please don't contribute further to the problem by sharing it publicly. It's obviously not meant to be a secret, but individual sharing one-on-one -on -one is the way that its creator hopes it to be used. Please don't post this file or a link to it in any group. Instead, please ask folks to reach out to you to get the link. So here's the thing. I can't give it to you. But if you move here and you come to one of my meetups, I'll give it to you, no problem. Or if you move here and you can't make a meetup, I'm not here, I will give it to you. But you have to reach out to me individually to ask for it. I can't just give it to you because that would go against the group's uh, wishes. So there is a great way to do things, and that's one of them. And then lastly, I will just say this, is that when you're looking for houses, Zillow and all the other stuff don't work here. Mostly what you're going to do is find it on cl uh, classificados online, and you can search by city and things like that. There's a big difference between like a house that maybe you're like, I want a $10 million house, or maybe you want a condo for 150000 Sure. You, so this is where you're going to want to look at. But I will just recommend my personal, I have two real estate agents, uh, Brenda and Victor. And Brenda's great for, she works at Iconic Realty, links in the description, and she can find you some pretty good places that uh, uh, will look pretty good for you. Uh, depending on if you're looking at like, if you're like just a single person, want a little condo or like you're bringing the whole family over, she's got something for you. And then also Victor is one of those guys who's pretty good at like finding like um, uh, investment real estate. So they're both good. I'll link them in the description and you can figure it out for yourself. And that's uh, what we have for that little piece. And then lastly, and we'll wrap this up because this was like probably my longest video I have ever done, but there's so much to cover, unfortunately. I will just say this, if you're gonna buy property, it's super overpriced, just so you know. Someone just bought a broken down shack for $1.6 million, depending on the area. It's like California prices. It all depends on where, take a look at those classificados. I talked about the different real estate agents and just so you know, Amazon does work here, they do deliver, but it takes a little bit of time and, and that's what we have. So lastly, just so you know, um, you can live in a tourist area if that's what your thing, but that wasn't mine. That's why I'm in Guaynabo. Language is important. I still say that most people speak English, but if you really want to fit in, you got to speak Spanish. No way around it. It's always around 80 degrees. No exceptions. It's like the coldest it'll get is 72, unless you go in the mountains and Fayardo, but, uh, Fayardo, but it's not that bad. Also, traffic lights, just so you know, uh, it's just a suggestion here in the different areas. Like they usually just either, either they, sometimes they work, but sometimes they're just blinking and people just blow right through them. But it's crazy, very few accidents. But traffic lights here are kind of like a suggestion, not like some they actually fall all the time. Electricity, there is rolling blackouts depending on where you're at. I get one probably once or twice a month and it lasts for like 30 minutes, no big deal. Safety, every city sucks and has their own safety issues, but there's a difference between the area that you're in and the weather. Uh, hurricane weather, uh, it's between like, uh, June and November, somewhere around there. Uh, so just be aware uh, that's when the big uh, time is. And then again, it's expensive to live here. And lastly, I will just say this, financial freedom versus fulfillment. It's all about what do you think is important to you and what you wanna do. So like you can live here and uh, pay not too much, or you can really be a part of the community and try to help build it up. And that's it. So I know that was long, but that was as much as I can put into it in as fast amount of time as I can. So if you liked today's video, give it a thumbs up. Uh, also consider subscribing. A lot of things we talk about on this channel are mostly cryptocurrency news, not Puerto Rico stuff. So just so you know, this is like a one-off type of thing. And that's it. So thanks so much for watching. I appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one.